first glance, it just seems like an ordinary blue plastic drum that was seen floating in the Pasig River in Escolta, Manila at around 11 a.m. on April 8, 2016. Two men working in the area noticed the drum. They said that while they were cleaning the area, they were shocked to see a drum floating. As the drum turned to the other side, they saw something like flesh through a small hole. Unsure of what was inside, they directly called the Coast Guard. When they opened the drum, they were shocked to see a woman inside. The woman was naked while both arms and legs were tied, and her face was fully wrapped with adhesive duct tape. A length of nylon cord was coiled around her neck. The victim was later identified as 56-year-old Adora Lazatin. Autopsy result concluded that she was strangled to death. Lazatin's husband, Osmundo, cut short his stint as a seaman to identify her body. According to a source, Lazatin advertised to sell her property in Las Piñas and told her son Ryan that she was about to meet a prospective buyer, who turned out to be one of the suspects, at a mall in the city on the morning of April 4, 2016. Ryan reported to the Las Piñas police that his mother was missing when she failed to answer his text messages in the afternoon of the same day and his inquiries with a friend of hers turned out to be futile. The NBI found out that multiple withdrawals were made using the victim's ATM card. Five suspects were arrested, three of them policemen. They were apprehended in five different operations. The NBI identified those arrested as Inspector L.G. Hakobe, police officers Edmund Gonzalez and Mark J. De Los Santos, former Bureau of Corrections intelligence agent Domingo Balanquit, and a civilian named Empire Salas. The NBI said initial investigation showed De Los Santos reportedly lured Lazatin into a maroon Suzuki Swift. He and Gonzalez later bound Lazatin's hands and blindfolded and gagged her as Hakobe and another accomplice served as lookouts. The suspects drove her to a safe house along C6 Road in Taguig, where they took her debit card and forced her to reveal its PIN number. After that, Hakobe and the others took Lazatin to another safe house, this one in Kalukan City. They stripped her of her clothes, leaving only her underwear, and strangled her. She was killed because she recognized Hakobe to be her former police neighbor. The five suspects were charged with kidnapping with homicide and violation of the Access Devices Regulation Law. This creepy photo is really the most disturbing one, especially if you know what really happened here. The photo hints the most gruesome and terrifying murders ever committed. It was November 1992, a Friday the 13th, when three friends became the victims of one of Spain's most high-profile and controversial criminal cases. Desiree Hernandez Folk, 14, Miriam Garcia Ibora, 14, and Antonia Gomez Rodriguez, 15, all residents of the municipality of Alcazar in Valencia, left their homes to head to a club where their school was having a party. The place was about two miles away, so they decided to hitchhike. They never arrived at the club and remained missing for 75 days until January 27, 1993, when two beekeepers checking some hives in an inhabitable wasteland known as La Romana, about 18 miles away, noticed what looked like an arm with a big watch coming out of the ground. It was clear that the girls had been beaten, tortured, and raped before being dumped in their clandestine graves. For the country of Spain, the case was, and still remains, the most gruesome murders they've ever seen. They called the police, and when they started digging, they found the severely decomposed bodies of three girls, all wrapped in the same rug. Around the shallow grave, they found several objects, including some pieces of paper that once put together proved to be a receipt from a local hospital, and it belonged to a man called Enrique Anglais, who'd been treated for syphilis. Police arrested Enrique and a friend of his called Miguel Ricard, but it was soon learned that Enrique wasn't the man they wanted. The real suspect was his brother, Antonio Anglez, who often used Enrique's identity. Both Miguel and Antonio had a history of petty crime. By the time authorities tried to arrest Antonio, he had disappeared, and to this day, he's never been found. The official report states that Ricard told investigators that he, Angles, and another unknown suspect saw the girls hitchhiking and offered them a ride. But instead of taking them to the club, they took them to an abandoned house in the isolated area where their bodies were later found. They proceeded to tie up the girls and rape two of them vaginally and anally, including with various objects. The men then left and went to a nearby town in order to get some food. 
They returned two hours later and proceeded to rape and torture the third girl. They continued to torture all three girls until they fell asleep. When they awoke the following day, the men forced the girls to walk to a pit they had dug, taking the opportunity to beat and torture them some more before shooting them and throwing the girls into the makeshift grave. In 1997, Miguel Ricard was found guilty and sentenced to 170 years in jail. However, in a controversial decision, he was released in 2013, still insisting that he was innocent and that he'd been used as a scapegoat. To this day, there are still a lot of conspiracy theories around these crimes. There are a lot of inconsistencies and mistakes in the handling of the crime scene and autopsies, and some details are considered suspicious, like how police conveniently found the hospital receipt lying around when it should have been blown by the wind in all those weeks. A lot of people believe that more than two people participated in the rapes and murders. DNA reports stated that pubic hairs from seven different individuals had been collected from the bodies, none of which belonged to the girls themselves nor the alleged perpetrators. Many theories have come out in the case over the years, including satanic involvement and the possibility that the girls were murdered in order to make a snuff film, possibly by an international ring of wealthy investors. At first glance, this trailer may just look like any common trailer out there, but the inside is a sexual torture chamber, and it's beyond sickening. David Parker Ray was an American serial rapist and suspected serial killer who preyed on women and subjected them to depraved acts of violence to satisfy his brutal appetite for sexual dominance. His modus operandi led him to be dubbed the Toy Box Killer. Born on the 6th of November, 1939 in New Mexico, Ray worked as a mechanic for New Mexico's Parks Department, and to the outside world, he was a regular, hard-working guy. In reality, he was a depraved torturer of women, a sexual sadist, and a suspected serial killer. His toy box was a motorhome. He allegedly spent $100,000 converting into a soundproof torture room. The room was equipped with whips, chains, clamps, leg spreaders, sex toys, surgical blades, and saws, syringes, and its own electricity generator so Ray could administer electrical shocks to his victims. He liked to strap them to a gynecologist's chair that had a mirror above it. Ray had several accomplices, including Cindy Hendy, a woman with an appetite for torture, and his own daughter, Glenda Jean Jesse Ray. They would help Ray lure women back to the toy box, and the nightmare would begin. Some victims were held for months at a time and subjected to some of the most depraved acts of sexual violence and torture. Transcripts of the audio tape Ray would play to his victim on their first day of captivity reveal the full horror of what they would have to endure. Ray was finally caught in 1999 after one of his victims, Cynthia Vigil, escaped. After three days of captivity, she waited until Ray went to work. Then, she grabbed a set of keys Hendy had left nearby. She unchained herself, stabbed Hendy, and fled wearing only an iron slave collar to a nearby house. The homeowner alerted police and Ray was arrested on the 22nd of March. When news spread of the heinous crimes and with mounting publicity, more victims came forward. The FBI launched an investigation and uncovered a further accomplice, Dennis Yancey. He admitted to strangling a former girlfriend after Ray had kidnapped and tortured her. Police estimate Ray raped, tortured, and killed up to 60 women. Despite this evidence, Ray was offered and agreed to a plea bargain. He was sentenced to 224 years in prison for the abduction and sexual torture of three young women. This mysterious closet looks so out of place. It's very unusual to find something like this in the middle of a walkway, and it just raises suspicions. In fact, the inside will haunt your dreams. In the morning of Saturday, February 15, 2014, a macabre crime caught the attention of the population of Karuaru. Around 7.30, a man was found dead inside a closet, deposited at the edge of a canal on Rua, Mississippi, in Bairro Salgado, Karuaru, Brazil. The victim was identified as 24-year-old Jailson Francisco da Silva, a resident of Garanhuns. His corpse was charred, tied, and wrapped in black garbage bags. 
Residents from the area said that it's common for people to dispose of unwanted furniture by abandoning it on the edge of the canal. The wardrobe just sat there until someone who expressed interest in repossessing it came to take a closer look at it. An elderly lady allegedly opened the door and found the corpse. The cause of death was a combination of blunt force trauma to the head and multiple stab wounds with a sharp object, supposedly a knife or a machete, to the upper body. The killing and charring likely took place elsewhere as there was no evidence of struggle or fire in and around the closet. The victim was a card-carrying member of the Church Assembly of God in Garenhuns. Given the nature of his death and the fact that he was an evangelist gave rise to a suspicion that he may have been killed in a satanic ritual. These photos already look so suspicious. Of course we would just think maybe it's just some abandoned items or trash inside the barrels at first. But wait until you know the real story behind these photos. To his neighbors, John Edward Robinson was a church-going family man. But on June 2nd, 2000, Kansas City Police arrested Robinson at his farm after a woman filed a sexual battery complaint against him and another charged him with stealing sex toys. After obtaining search warrants, investigators found the decaying bodies of two women, later identified as Isabella Lewicka and Suzette Troughton, in two 85-pound chemical drums on his property. When the bodies of three more women were found in storage units, police began to unravel the world of Robinson, a con man, embezzler, and sadomasochistic killer whose habit of luring his victims in bondage chat rooms earned him the moniker, the internet's first serial killer. An autopsy revealed that all of the women had been killed with blows to the head by a blunt object, possibly a hammer. Back in 1964, Robinson, who had been attending school to become an x-ray technician but ended up dropping out, moved to Kansas City and married Nancy Jo Lynch. The couple had three children together, and on the surface, Robinson maintained a perfect family facade. But behind the scenes, Robinson had a long criminal history. In 1984, John Edward Robinson murdered his first known victim, Paula Godfrey, a 19-year-old woman he had hired to work as a sales representative for a shell company he'd set up. While Robinson was a suspect in her disappearance, he sent letters bearing Godfrey's signature to the young woman's family in an effort to convince them she was still alive. Consequently, the investigation into Godfrey's disappearance was dropped. In 1985, using the name John Osborne, he met Lisa Stacy and her four-month-old daughter Tiffany at a battered women's shelter in Kansas City. He promised Lisa a job and an apartment in Chicago and asked her to sign several sheets of blank stationery. A few days later, Robinson contacted his brother and sister-in-law, who had been unable to adopt a baby through traditional channels, and informed them that he knew of a baby whose mother had committed suicide. For $5,500 in legal fees, Don and Helen Robinson received a baby, who was later determined by DNA testing to be Tiffany Stacy. Baby Tiffany's biological mother, Lisa Stacy, was never heard from again. In 1987, Robinson hired another young woman, 27-year-old Catherine Clampett, promising her not only a job, but a closet full of new clothing and lots of traveling. However, Clampett disappeared in June 1987, and she has never been found dead or alive. From 1987 to 1993, Robinson was behind bars on fraud convictions. While incarcerated, he met 49-year-old Beverly Bonner, the prison librarian, and after he was released, she divorced her husband and moved to Kansas to work for him. Robinson arranged for Bonner's alimony checks to be forwarded to them, and he kept cashing them for years. Bonner was never seen again. Robinson began to take his scams online by perusing websites using the name Slave Master, looking for sexually submissive women. Sheila Faith, 45, responded. She was thrilled when Robinson offered to pay medical expenses for her 15-year-old daughter, Debbie, who had spinal bifida. In 1994, the mother and daughter moved to Kansas City and disappeared. Incredibly, Robinson was becoming a popular figure in the online chat rooms. In 1999, he offered a job and bondage relationship to Isabella Lewicka, a 21-year-old Polish immigrant. During the summer of 1999, she vanished. Suzette Troughton, a nurse, also disappeared during this time after moving to Kansas to be another one of Robinson's sex slaves. By 1999, police were beginning to link Robinson to some of the missing persons investigations. 
In 2000, he was arrested, and after investigators searched his farm, they found the bodies of Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her daughter Debbie Faith in storage units. In 2002, Robinson was convicted for the murders, along with multiple lesser charges, and received a death sentence. Early in the morning on November 15, 1959, this unassuming farmhouse was the location of the brutal murders of four members of the Clutter family. Herb and Bonnie, their daughter Nancy, and son Kenyon were brutally murdered in their Holcomb, Kansas home. Richard Hickok and Perry Smith, parolees who had heard from a one-time fellow inmate that the Clutters were wealthy and kept money in their home, were convicted of the crimes. They went to the Clutter home when four of the six family members happened to be home. Once entering the home, they realized that there wasn't a safe which contained money, and they awoke Herb Clutter. Mr. Clutter gave them the little cash he had and said there was no more. They aroused the remainder of the family and again searched their house, confirming Clutter's story for themselves. They ransacked the entire house, getting no more than roughly $50, a pair of binoculars, and a transistor radio. Once the two had all they could find, and assuming that Herb Clutter wasn't volunteering the information of where the cash was stored, they executed all four family members. When officers arrived, Herb Clutter, 48, lay sprawled on a mattress in the basement, stabbed, his throat slashed, and a shotgun charge fired to his head. He wore pajamas. His hands were bound and his mouth was taped shut. On a couch in the adjoining room was 15-year-old Kenyon Neal Cutter, bound, gagged, and shot in the head. In separate upstairs bedrooms were the bodies of Mrs. Bonnie May Clutter, 45, and Nancy May Clutter, 16. Mrs. Clutter was bound and gagged, Nancy only bound. Each had been shot in the head. On December 30, 1959, Hickok and Smith were arrested in Las Vegas, Nevada, and brought back to Kansas. They were tried, found guilty of the murders of the Clutter family, and executed by hanging on April 15, 1965. In this photo, it just looks like a very messy garage, except there is something eerie hidden just beneath the property. Hidden away under a Jeep in the garage of her own 1.5 million pound home, this is the opening to the 15 foot deep cesspit from where the arm of children's author Helen Bailey was spotted protruding from raw sewage in July 2016. The 51-year-old writer had been missing for three months when police officers opened the hatch and found her body alongside that of her beloved dachshund Boris. Miss Bailey's fiancé, Ian Stewart, is accused of drugging and killing her before dumping her body at the lavish home the couple shared in Royston, Hertfordshire. Stewart secretly gave her a sleeping drug in increasing amounts over time as part of a long-planned plot which had money as its driving motive. It is believed that on April 11th, Stewart killed her while she was in a stupefied state and hid her remains in the waste tank, parking a car over the access point. Ms. Bailey was said to be very successful and worth around four million pounds, earning around 5,000 pounds a month in royalties from her books. Stewart was in line to be a very substantial benefactor of the author's four million pound fortune in the event of her death.